after doing my video on Malcolm X being bisexual, I actually felt a lot of interesting things in relation to a lot of the comments that I got because they kind of made me feel bad. Do you want to see some? Because I all got all sorts of comments. First one is, he was Muslim. He was Muslim? Okay. Why is his sexuality even a topic? Hmm. Stop it, bro. Oh, I'm your bro. I'm your bro. That man was not bisexual. Gay men, wow. Why would you matter? <laughs> then there's the comment. Was putting his height in this a subtle form of fetishization? I knew that I probably would want to make a reaction video to my other video about whether or not Malcolm X was bisexual because I just found the topic so interesting. And as I mentioned in that video, what I find more interesting than the actual question of whether or not Malcolm X is bisexual, what I find even more interesting is our social, emotional, and political reactions to this. And in all of these reactions, I read a lot of different things. I read, don't talk about him like that. He was a Muslim man. He was a family man. Or don't talk about him like that. You don't know. Like, you can't be spread. You, you can't trust the research. Why does it matter? It matters because queer erasure is literally a fucking part of history. It's a part of Black history. It's a part of Muslim history. And it's a part of our entire collective history. So when we're engaging with questions about whether or not Malcolm X was bisexual, yes, the first paramount thing is that we take into account whether or not we trust the research that is written about these allegations of him being bisexual and also heeding Malcolm X's daughter's criticisms of these forms of research and these biographies. But beyond that, it's important to understand and articulate why we may be also reluctant to talk about queer representation in history because of homophobia, because of misogynoir, because of a collective hatred of femininity. And this can come across in many ways. And so when we're thinking about blackness and its relation to masculinity and the patriarchy, homophobia is present in the black community. When we think of Islam and the different expressions of it all around the world, because there are so many different expressions of it, we have to think about how there's the Western assumption that Islam equals homophobia, although there is evidence of that throughout the Islamic religion. And then we also have to consider the fact that we have clear evidence throughout various parts of history about how queer and LGBTQIA people have been targeted and how people like Bayard Rustin or James Baldwin were ousted out of black movements in a variety of ways because of their sexuality and because of their openness about their queerness, bisexuality, homosexuality. And so when we start from this standpoint, the question becomes less, was Malcolm X bisexual and more, why are so many people in resistance to this possibility? And what does it say about our willingness to imagine real complex expressions of queerness throughout Black, Muslim, and radical history? So welcome to another Black Radical History lesson. We're gonna dig into it. So this video is going to be for anyone that is interested in exploring why queerness or bisexuality is a discomfort point for many people when looking at black, queer, radical, or Muslim history, and for people that just want to dig into a little bit more about like, let's talk about the complexities of homophobia, because I think it can come up in many different ways. It can look like many different things. And I've seen a lot of it in the comments to my last video. And if you haven't seen that Malcolm X bisexual video, I highly recommend you check it out because the intro is hilarious. But to dig... But for this first section, I want to have some bare bones kind of definitions around what Islam is and what are different representations of queerness in Islam and the Quran. And the first resource I have pulled up is the Human Rights Coalition has a resource that is titled Stances of Faith on LGBTQIA Issues, Islam, Sunni, and Shi'i. More than half a billion Muslims inhabit this planet, and they inhabit geographic, linguistic, and cultural spaces that are enormously diverse. As a result, their beliefs on issues relating to LGBTQIA people cannot be easily summarized. With over a billion followers, Islam is the second largest religion in the world and noted for its diversity of culture and ethnicity. Founded by the Prophet Muhammad in 622 CE, Islam is an Abrahamic religion that shares its roots with Judaism and Christianity and recognizes Abraham, Moses, and Jesus as prophets. Its sacred texts are the Quran, and secondary sources are found in cultural practices such as Sunnah and less so in Hadith which continue to be studied and interpreted by both scholars and the faithful. At the core of Islam is the Shah, 
Shahada, Shahada, a declaration of faith that states, there is no God but God, and later adaptations ad added, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. The Shahada is one of the five pillars of Islam that includes charitable giving, fasting, praying several times each day, and going on pilgrimage to Mecca, if economically feasible at least once in a lifetime. Because Islam has no central governing body, it is not possible to state clear policies regarding issues of interest to LGBTQIA people. Depending on nationality, generation, family upbringing, and cultural influences, Islamic individuals and institutions fall along a wide spectrum, from welcoming and inclusive to a level of rejection that could be marked by a range of actions from social sequestrianism to physical violence. And so what I read in this is that within Islam, there is a vast array of complexities around how people view homosexuality, how they view queerness, how they view LGBTQIA-ness. And I wanted to bring in another perspective here from an article from Cinemobile, New York, titled Covering Up Queer Muslims. <clears throat> and this opens by stating, it's assumed that being queer and Muslim or being erased within a Muslim community is irreconcilable. As a result, to be Muslim and queer means existing between two spaces. On one side is a Western space, where certain rights are granted for queer folk, where we can elaborate on what it means to be queer, even while state legislatures pass laws condemning our existence. On the other exists a space where we must hide, where secularism itself is a charged subject and belief in Allah is seen as exclusively heteronormative. I often feel Islam's only reference point in queerness is violence and oppression. Although violence against queer people in Muslim communities is a real issue, how do we reconcile that in the area before Orientalism, there were, love, there were letters, poems, songs, paintings, and photographs which attest to queer and gender non-conforming communities that lived within these same communities. For years, I had grown up thinking that queerness did not exist in Muslim, particularly Albanian history. And for years, this historical absence became personal proof to me that, what, that I was an aberration, abnormal and unnatural. However, in recent years, more and more evidence has come to light providing that historically queer communities existed in Albania, Turkey, Iraq, Palestine, Egypt, Sudan, Senegal, and many more regions of the world within Muslim communities. The covering up of Islam has not only been a physical veil, as American media would promote, but throughout a colonial process of erasing these identities and perceiving them through a white European Christian gaze. And what I love about this article in particular is that it goes through all of these different examples, histories, artworks, examples of artwork that show people throughout different points of Muslim history depicting queerness, depicting homosexuality, depicting LGBTQIA life, and it being something that is contested both among Muslims who will read the Quran and reference Sodom and Gomorrah and say that the attack on these savages was mainly because they were homosexual, while other people simply read that as the people living in these particular areas, Sodom and Gomorrah, were particularly bad people because they would literally attack and assault the people passing by, no matter what their gender. It was not about their sexuality. And so in my reading and researching these things for this video, I've sort of began to understand this sort of complex relation to Muslim identity in the diaspora through the same way that I understand Christianity as a Jamaican American, as a black person. There are Christians that are very, very tied to the Bible and they read all of the terminology and the verses literally. And then there are other interpretations that are based in dialectical materialism, that are based in historical context, and that speak to how Christianity on some level through certain perspectives demand a love for all human beings and that we are all born the way we are meant to be in this world without all of the boundaries, constraints, and stigmas that more conservative forms of religion heap onto us. And so when we're thinking about this question of whether or not Malcolm X was queer, whether or not he was bisexual, would his participation in the Nation of Islam have turned him away from this? There are many, many different considerations. There is the fact that the Nation of Islam is known to be a very homophobic branch of Islam. I mean, even in the last few years, the Nation of Islam has slammed BET and Little Nas X, particularly Little Nas X, because he is this deviant expression of black masculinity that is trying to like push the gay agenda. 
And if we look at even my last video where I reference um, one of Malcolm X's daughter's criticisms of, I think, Manning Marable's book, which alleges that Malcolm X might have been bisexual or might have been done bisexual sex work, his daughter says, my father loved all human beings. He wouldn't have had a problem with gay people. He was not particularly gay. And so even in this reading of Malcolm X that we could have, we can't flatten him into a nation of Islam Muslim because there was a point in time where he saw the contradictions within various aspects of the nation of Islam and decided to leave and turned more towards an internationalism and a deeper communalism. So would this communalism not have included some sort of serious consideration or perspective on LGBTQIA people if Malcolm X had been given the time and life to live through the 70s and the 80s, the movements towards sexual liberation. All of these things could have maybe opened up Malcolm X to new worlds that the Malcolm X that died in 1965 would have had no chance to ever been exposed to. And in the ways that we can understand the complexities of queer Muslim identity, we can see various pieces of evidence to this today. I can think of the page Queer Habibi, which is an artist who does beautiful LGBTQIA depictions of Muslim people in various settings, whether it be sultry or in public. I think of also the social media page, which shares anarchist news and anti-capitalist news and perspectives and media from a queer Muslim perspective. There's also the forthcoming book, Queer Hijab Blues, uh, by the author Lamia H. And this book is a memoir depicting this author's life as a queer Muslim person that eventually moves to the U.S. and has to contend with their gender, sexuality, and their non-normative perspectives on Western processes related to queer identity, like coming out. And so even in this description of this book, we can see an engagement with contemporary life through a queer Muslim non-binary person's lens. And in terms of the readings or perspectives on history in relation to queer Muslim history, how many times are we having conversations where we're actually listening to queer Muslim people speak to their own experiences and the intersectionality of how they relate to their religion, how they relate to their spirituality, how they relate to their body and their autonomy. So if you haven't checked out this book, I highly recommend you check it out. I also found a podcast that was a really good listen. It's the Queer Collective Podcast, and it is titled Can You Be Muslim and Queer? featuring Bilal Hamed. And I'll play a few clips of this podcast so you can hear for yourself. Every single thing that you said or did was policed by everyone ar yeah. ar around you, right? If you're wearing something pink. Yeah. It's like, dude, like, are you gay or something? You know, like, yeah. that, and that would be my every single day, right? Where it was like, yeah. my majority of my closet is just like not colorful clothes. Forget jewelry. I wouldn't even like do skincare yeah. because it, I was so scared mm. that it was considered s something feminine and that yeah. it would like out me to people, right? But what I really love about this podcast is that it does talk about a lot of the complexities of how areas that have a more conservative Islam kind of have this policy around queerness or LGBTQIA-ness that is, it can be tolerated as long as it isn't flashed in front of our faces or this kind of don't ask, don't tell kind of mentality. And when I was listening to this podcast, it really made me realize that I want to read and engage with more queer Muslim um, perspectives on life and politics because it really reminded me of like growing up and visiting Jamaica, of growing up in a Black family, being in a Black community where you being queer is a problem if it's visible enough for it to be speculated about. And it can be a thing where it's very much tolerated, but not accepted. And I think these sort of commonalities in terms of um, these more conservative strains of religion, whether it be Christianity or whether it be Islam, we can see this sort of thread of there being this sort of social space where it has existed in the past, where it maybe hasn't been giving a, given a complex name or a complex series of names, but there is this sort of notion that within Muslim spaces, within Christian spaces, that queerness can exist, but it might just it might just not be legible in those spaces as queerness, as LGBTQIA-ness. It might be seen as like, oh, they're a little bit weird, or they're funny, or they just don't date people, or oh, I mean, they just like, they live over there. Like they're, they're kind of Americanized now. They're Western or yeah, like maybe America did that to you. Like there are all these processes that this area of understanding queerness and Islam, 
I think should be understood with the same complexity that some people may offer Christianity or Judaism or other religions in terms of how there are some areas where it's celebrated, there are some areas where it's simply accepted, but people don't push to make it a visible thing in public life. And there are also other spaces where people are fighting to define their narratives for themselves, just like this author Lamia, and just like how I attempted to do in my own ways in my debut book, When They Tell You To Be Good. I think as a writer, it's very important that we have these sort of historical records that are first person perspectives about what it means to live at the margins of a certain kind of society. I think about the utility of slave narratives of the past, whether it be Frederick Douglass or Harriet Tubman or other former slaves. I think about how many immigration narratives have been coming out of the US and Central and South America over the last decade in reaction to all of the various immigration policies, the peeling back of DACA and the migrant caravan crisis at the U.S.-Mexican border. All of these are symbologies of the fact that the further and further that we progress as a human species, ideally the more complex and diverse narratives we have in our landscape to show that erasure and stigma is, should not only be the controlling force in how we look at our histories, it should also be a willingness to engage with what actually existed and what foundational texts religions, ideas, paradigms do we have that cause us to turn away from the literal reality of the fact that queer people have existed throughout every part of, of human life. And this includes Islam, this includes Christianity, this includes literally every part of the world. And this also begs the question of, for some Muslim people, why is queerness so in opposition to their religiosity, their spirituality, and can this be changed or overcome? And I think this is extremely a general question. I think there are so many people that could speak to this better than I, and there are so many specific contexts that I think need to be deconstructed in this kind of conversation or thinking about this. But it is important, an important question, and I and I when I really think about homophobia in any kind of setting or arena. There should be the question of why is queerness in opposition to the status quo? And who has established that? And who is it actually hurting if it did or does exist? And then in the second part of this video, I really want to dig into what I feel like is a bit more of the black perspective on why I think so many people are in resistance, <clears throat> in resistance to the potential idea that Malcolm X could have been bisexual. And in so many of these comments, I, I feel like I read people kind of essentially saying a number of things. One, we shouldn't spread lies about this man and we don't know if it was actually true and you can't trust the research. And then the other side, which is to say like, speculating about Malcolm X in this way is disrespectful or it devalues his legacy. And there's, and when we really look at how the patriarchy and homophobia operates within young black people's lives, especially young black male lives, we can see how homophobia operates as a means to police the black body. I've talked about this in other videos, but it also fits in line with Bell Hook's notion of soul murder, which is at a young age, young boys learn again and again that there are rules that they need to follow or else they won't be socially accepted. And so they learn to hide parts of themselves, to kill off parts of themselves piece by piece. And so with this in mind, I ask the question, what in Malcolm X's life would have pushed or compelled him to be a certain kind of masculinity? Would it have been the dysfunction in his home life? Would it have been the fact that him and his siblings were separated by the <clears throat> child welfare system? Would it have been the fact that he struggled to get through high school and was pushed in the spaces with white people and eventually ended up in the streets and sold drugs and would pimp people out and had to find subversive ways to make money? Embedded in all of these different criticisms of the idea or American concept of Malcolm X being bisexual is this idea that femininity is somehow a denigration of a black person's identity, a black person's place. And this kind of argument around like being gay or bisexual might have made him less tough or revolutionary, it really is just based in like classic misogyny, misogyny noir, because how many dope, radical, revolutionary queer people existed? How many dope, rap, revolutionary queer women existed? How many radical revolutionary women were part of all these movements and somehow, because of the patriarchy, 
their value and the work that they've put in is valued far, far less. And when we also think about the implications of homophobia, queer erasure, this denial of the possibility altogether that Malcolm X would have been bisexual, it also very much fits into this patriarchal logic that is also based in homophobia, which always demands a straight telling of history. And if we think about all of the various radical movements that we can see throughout different points, especially in the Black experience, whether it be the Civil Rights Movement or whether it be the Black Power Movement, whether it be Black Lives Matter, throughout all of these various eras of Black radical moment in space, we can see threads of Black conservatism or threads of queer erasure. In the Civil Rights Movement, there was hella religious conservatism that leaned into this nonviolent strategy, which was based in a certain kind of respectability that said, if black people are nonviolent, maybe we can be seen as human. Where does queerness fit into that? If you are so subversive that you can't even be accepted in the civil rights movement, what does that say? In the Black Liberation Army and the Black Panther Party, there was so much misogyny and misogyny noir. It is only safe to assume that queerness was not welcomed or at least celebrated within the party. We can say that Huey P. Newton said that he didn't care about homosexuality, it wasn't really a problem to him, he saw LGBTQIA people as human being, but what does it also say that Huey P. Newton was accused of and potentially killing a sex worker? What does it say that he has been accused of so many other wrongs and isms within the party, particularly domestic violence? If we look at the Black Lives Matter movement, we can look at all of the criticisms of the elitism of the founders of it, hoarding money. We can look at how there are many critiques of how the mainstream black public tends to prop up the slain men and boys of the black community as opposed to the slain women, girls, and LGBTQIA people who have been harmed by police or horizontal gun violence. <clears throat> what matters less is whether or not he was bisexual and more that there is still so much resistance to the possibility that it could have been the truth. And if it was the truth, it probably would have made him cooler. Thank you for watching another one of my videos. If you want to support me or this channel, follow me on Patreon, link below, or become a member of this YouTube channel where for a few bucks a month, you can get early access to videos or exclusive comments on YouTube videos or in my community section. And let me know what other topics you'd wanna see or talk about. And I think in this topic of the black community and homophobia, it's really important to name the specifics of why and how homophobia shows up in the black community. And for me, I mean, I came out in the black community and the Jamaican community, so I understand homophobia. And what I will say about my own coming out experience is that it was deeply painful in a lot of ways to know that I grew up in a household that was very homophobic and spoke about it very openly. And then I also went to black schools where it was very homophobic and it, the gay bashing was just normal. And the fact that I look and look back at my childhood and say, I grew up in this diasporic sandwich of a homophobia that both made me question the validity of my Jamaican culture and also my black culture, I think there is also this very real side of homophobia and blackness and queerness that really can compel a lot of black people to leave various aspects or parts of the black community for our own comfort or survival or safety and how this then leads to a sort of willing or unwilling queer erasure how many black lgbtqia people would exist more in black spaces openly if they were celebrated and accepted instead of just being tolerated and how can we apply the same logic and lens to history when we're thinking about malcolm x and the reactions that people have to the potential to the potential idea that he was bisexual all right happy pride month consider buying a copy of my book black radical reader and maybe also consider picking up a copy of my debut book when they tell you to be good see you later